looks like you did you did a master's uh, and then a PhD. And I think that's when uh, Bertozzi had moved. Is that what happened that's there? Correct. Yeah. Okay, yeah. So for those of you in the audience, it's a, so in some of the sciences, it's a little bit uncommon to stop to get a master's and a PhD separately. Um, but if an advisor moves from one institution to another, that could be uh, what happens. Um, so, you know, so I think uh, your time with Bertozzi likely influenced a lot of the work that you're going to talk about today. Um, and for those of you who don't know, um, so uh, Carolyn Bertozzi was her PhD advisor, which is kind of like co-starring with Tom Hanks in the chemical biology world. So it's a right. very, very big deal. Um, and she is going to talk to us a little bit about, I hopefully about her equity work, her own personal trajectory. Um, and just a fun fact that I picked up, she speaks three languages. Um, which I personally uh, respect and think that's really, really cool. She's going to talk to us about um, her work in tuberculosis diagnostics. And I was telling some of my own colleagues how i um, very excited for this talk. I think it'll be nice to hear about a diagnostic that's not for uh, finding out if somebody has COVID for a change in, in today's <laughs> climate. So thank you very much for joining us. We are very, very happy uh, to have you here today. And for those of you in the audience, um, if you don't mind, you can put, pose questions in the chat and I will sort of be fielding those as they come up as appropriate. And then we will have an extended Q&A at the end of the seminar. Okay, so if you are all ready, uh, please take it away. Thank you again. Thank you, Christina, for such a kind introduction. Thank you all uh, for inviting me today. I, I love being back in the community college uh, community because that's where I started and that's where I, I sort of I owe to give back given that when I was an immigrant they took a chance on me and, and here I am today so I'm really happy to be back here and hope to return the favor to the next generation of scientists all right so I'll, I'll put together I'll share my slides are you able to see my slides all right Yep, Great. Good. Perfect. Um, so I'll, I'll talk to you about my uh, PhD work with Carolyn Bertozzi. And as Christina just mentioned, I started my PhD at, at Berkeley and then I ended up moving to Stanford halfway through my PhD. Um, hence why I mastered out of Berkeley and then continued getting my PhD degree at Stanford. Um, but before I get there, I, I'll sort of begin from where it all started. Um, and gives you a little bit of a flavor of where I come from and, and my own journey to where I landed today. So my life began in Burundi. Um, it's, it's a small East Central African country. I don't know if you can see on the map there um, uh, in Africa. And it's very gorgeous. It's, it's one of the most beautiful places on earth. It's tropical all year round. So it's really warm. It's um, it's humid, but it's beautiful, um, and, and honestly, it's it's one of the great places that I love hanging, spending my time um, uh, for me. And while everything, while there's a lot to appreciate, the country itself has a, a troubled political history. And so, when I was born, I was sort of born into this crazy world going on around me. And just to give you some um, understanding of what was going on, you know, the country was colonized prior to 1962 and declared independence then. And then with the political change and sort of ascendance to our, our own uh, independence, there was a lot of unrest, a lot of infighting throughout the 60s, the 70s, the 80s, and, and in the 90s, in the early 90s, that's when I was born. And when I was just a baby, the events that most of you know in Rwanda um, also happened in Burundi. And so there was a, a civil war when I was just a baby until um, most recently in 20, 2010, I believe. So most of my life when I was a child, most of my childhood, uh, most of my teenage years were spent in, in a country ongoing a civil war. Uh, so I, I, I very much, um, have experienced the 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 all the the emotions that come with that, and I, I empathize with a lot with immigrants and refugees, because myself I immigrated to the United States as part of that. But you know, 
on a day to day though, I didn't really feel like that. You know, I, I, I was at home most of the time. This is me around age four uh, with my siblings. And I was just, you know, just a happy kid running around, trying to understand the world around me. Um, and I had an unusual level of curiosity. Even to this day, my mom still complains about how many questions I used to ask her when I was a little kid. Um, and I would ask you a bunch of questions about the sky and, and why the world is the way it is. Why is the sky blue? Why are animals this way and that way? And it, it just really just an annoying kid. Um, being the only uh, girl in my family, I have three older brothers. I, I very quickly noticed the difference when it came to uh, expectation for education. So my brothers were always pushed towards excellence in education, which for me wasn't always the case. And you could clearly see that there was only one university in the country, and it was mostly men who were taking these science courses, biology courses, um, and, and very few women, if any. And so I sort of already understood that as I was growing up, and I sort of put that on the back burner. I had a million questions, but there was really nothing you could do with it, with these questions. Up until um, we managed to leave the country and move to the US. Um, and, and arriving in the US was sort of a, uh, uh, a world of opportunity that was opening up to me. So here, this is me at around age 17. Uh, I had just bought this new car after working for a year at, Sa at Vons, so Safeway. I don't know where you are actually, in California. So it's, what, Vons? Um, yeah, so it was a courtesy click for a year. I, I needed to save some money. It was just me and my brothers. Um, and I had I finally managed to buy a car and I had to take this picture. And I even dressed up for this picture just to look because I was so proud of myself. And, and after that year as well, I am, because I started saving up and work and banding together with my siblings, I could minimize the number of hours that I, I was spending at work and actually start taking some classes at a community college. Um, and right as the beginning, I was finding my footing in the US, I had to learn a new language. Uh, I, you know, when I was growing up, I spoke Hyundai in, in French, but not English. Um, I had to find ways to earn money and start a livelihood and then understand what this new society looked like and meant for me, what kind of social life would I have and how could I get back into what I'm really passionate about, which is understanding the world we live in. I was really quite fortunate spending time at, the, at San Diego Mesa College uh, because there were lots of summer research programs that one could sign up for. And so that's certain, that's exactly what I did. So the first time I was there, I was an HMI scholar at UC San Diego. Um, and then I transferred to UCSD and then I became a uh, NIH uh, T32 Mark scholar. And I spent that summer at UCSF. And then the last summer before I graduated from UC San Diego, I, uh, I, I, I spent that summer at UC Berkeley starting my doctorate degree. And this is just a picture of me and my UC San Diego uh, undergraduate advisor who's now at UCLA um, and I, I, I'm still in touch with today. So I'll just briefly go over my summer program, my summer research work. Um, and it was very much uh, rooted in, the, in the, my own passion and understanding pathogens and understanding or investigating how we can find either new therapies for pathogens or new, new un, un, discovering the mechanism of from pathogens and, and ways that we can target them. So this is me in my first summer. I was still at San Diego Mesa College. Um, and I studied, I spent the summer in San Diego studying worms or helminths. And I understood, I, I was really motivated by this work because back in Burundi, worm disease is, is very prevalent and everybody knows about them. And there, some, sometimes there are just no real good drugs to treat them. And you just kind of hope that things get better on their own. And so I was really excited to be in this lab and I collaborated with my other um, summer research undergraduate student here on the picture. And we, we worked together to look at a, a, a large uh, library of compounds that were already available in the lab and, and test them onto the worms and see which ones were active against the worms or not. 
And I was really happy because that a few months later, we we managed to get to go to our first scientific conference when I uh, presented my poster session here in the picture on the on the right. And it, it was eye opening to me because when I went to SACNES in that year, I saw a lot of people who looked like me, who were postdocs, who were faculty members, who were staff, who were doing amazing work that I, I, I had never seen in my life before. I was exposed to that kind of potential career path um, at that point. So I got really invested in research. And once I transferred to San Diego, I wanted to just keep doing that. Um, so this is the next summer that I spent at UC, at UC San Francisco. And this is the T, uh, NIH T32 Mark summer program. And uh, here in the middle, these pictures that you see is my friend Jackie. And, and he, this is me again, presenting my poster session at the end. And all of these folks um, were still connected to this day. And this is Quinn, who was my postdoctoral advisor. And he's a really, really good friend now, um, even though we're, we don't work together anymore. And so during this summer, I, I dove a bit deeper into molecular biology and understanding the world of RNA and how RNA sort of uh, is involved in many process, biological processes. Um, and that was really fun, actually. And then I came back to UC San Diego and I continued uh, studying RNA splicing and RNA uh, regulation with Tr Professor Tracy Johnson. And, and, and throughout that experience, I, I, I sort of solidified my passion for science and, and really leveraging the, the molecular biology to understand tools that we can build for infectious diseases. So that's sort of my, 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 my mindset at the time and thinking about what I could do with that. And mind you, up at this, this point, I still couldn't, I still didn't see myself doing a PhD. You know, the image of what a scientist looked like was not me. And so it took a little bit of encouragement. Having uh, Tracy and Julia around me were, were tremendous supporters and, and in sort of giving me enough confidence to, to do the application and, and get through, go through the interviews. And it eventually set me up for success. And I got an offer from Berkeley where I ended up joining. So by the time I applied to PhD programs, I had spent three years getting research experience in a variety of scientific uh, projects and several mentors. And so when I got my acceptance, I was actually ready for grad school. I had done, um, I had great experience and I could do it, uh, design my own projects um, as I see, as I saw fit. So here I started at, um, uh, my PhD at University of California at Berkeley in molecular and cell biology. And when I got into the program um, in my first year, I had simple goals for my PhD. The first was find a project I liked. Um, so this has something to do with biology and chemistry. Um, in infectious diseases, uh, find, I mean, this is pre-pandemic, so not many chemists were thinking about infectious disease at that time. Um, the second goal was to work with someone that I really liked that could be a great supporter of me and, and understand my unusual backgrounds. Um, you know, publish a paper, hopefully, um, and finished in a reasonable time and eventually just get a job and start making money and, and contributing back to my community. And so when I started at Berkeley, I, I, I was really, really lucky that I, I met Professor Carolyn Bertozzi, who at the time was a professor at UC Berkeley in the chemistry department. Um, but as Christina mentioned, she ended up switching and moving to Stanford halfway through my PhD. And she's now a professor of chemistry at Stanford University. And it turns out that Professor Carolyn, uh, Carolyn, what she's known for is building this, this type or this field of chemistry called chemical biology. And the, the idea there is that you can build chemi chemical reactions that can occur within living systems, so within biological cells without actually disturbing the cells themselves. And I'll, I'll dive a bit deeper into that in a few slides from now. 
Um, but so I was, so she's a chemist, chemistry trained, but she was using her chemical chemistry training into biological system, which is exactly what I was looking for. And on top of that, it happened that she had a project that was focused on tuberculosis. And at the time, um, she was leveraging her chemistry tools to design technologies that could allow us to better study tuberculosis. And, and I thought that was, it met, it, it, it was really well matched with my goals and I decided to join her group. And so now let's shift gears a little bit and dive into what my actual research was and, and, and what was the outcome of that research. And then I'll end this presentation with just um, words of wisdom or lessons that I've learned uh, and, and tell you a little bit about what I'm, where I am now. So um, when I started this work, tuberculosis had been a global threat for centuries. And in fact, it was the, the, the leading infectious uh, killer caused by a single pathogen. I mean, now everybody knows uh, about COVID-19, uh, but uh, and, and it has overtaken the global health as a pandemic, but TB has been endemic for centuries. And, and, and it's quick, when you look at the map that I'm showing you here on the slides, it's quickly apparent that the incidence of TB cases is higher in developing countries like Burundi. Again, it's right here in Central Africa, where resources are already stretched thin. And so what's worse is that with the advent of COVID-19 pandemic, when you think about all of the resources that had to go into managing COVID-19 pandemic, um, all of them were already in place because of infectious diseases like tuberculosis had been um, uh, in place before. So uh, all of those pipelines were rerouted from tuberculosis, malaria, um, to now handle COVID-19. So this is great for COVID-19 pandemic, but it's actually not so great for these other diseases like tuberculosis. So right at the beginning of the pandemic, the New York Times published an article that, that asserted that the biggest monster that's spreading, it's not coronavirus, but actually TB. And that's because like, when you think of the mask that you wear, the, the other protective uh, equipment that we use, like in this picture, there's a researcher that's covered with this, this whole gown of units, goggles, uh, gloves, um, all of that stuff is what we use to study TB and also what we wear to treat patients with tuberculosis. Again, when you, when you think about diagnostic and treatment pipelines, or even health workers that are in charge of keeping track of uh, infectious disease control in the community, all of them were refocused towards pandemic management. So as a result, any pre-pandemic progress in the area of tuberculosis control could be set back by years because uh, all these pipelines are now focused on, um, um, on the coronavirus and TB, uh, TB tuberculosis incidence and tuberculosis mortality are predicted to rise. And this, we're already starting to see that even here in the United States where people who uh, are exposed or infected with tuberculosis actually wait until they're very, very, very sick to go to the doctor and, and get better. So that being said, I'm not a public health specialist. I'm, I'm a biochemist. So I my work focused primarily on the pathogen that causes TB. And just to quickly give you an idea, um, Mycobacterium tuberculosis is the name of the pathogen that causes tuberculosis. And MTB is transmitted sort of similar to how uh, SARS-CoV-2, the positive agent of COVID-19 is also transmitted. So, you know, you have someone who is in a room, is either breathing, talking, or coughing, and, and they uh, release aerosols that contain the, these pathogens that can then be breathed in by someone else in, in the room. Um, uh, and here on the right is sort of a schematic of what the mycobacterium tuberculosis pathogen looks like. And what's really unique about MTB and why it has endured for um, years and centuries across generations of society is because it has this really unusual cell envelope that is not 
common in the world of microbes. It has this really thick, waxy, fatty, hydrophobic uh, cell surface called microlic acid or micromembrane um, that essentially works like an armor around the pathogen and blocks or makes it very difficult to get anything in or out of the cell. And so because of that, they, they, once they're inside our lungs, it's, it's very difficult to treat the pathogen and, and not hurt our own cells. So patients who have to be often have really strong side effects because they have to take really, really strong medication to be able to kill these cells. But as chemists, um, we, we were thinking about ways to then sort of pick apart at this uh, strong uh, armor and leverage our own chemical understanding to either poke holes or maybe find a key to the doorway and, and insert something into the cell that could potentially be used as a therapy. So in particular, like I mentioned before, when I joined Carolyn's lab, uh, they were interested in building tools that can give us either, that could be like a painting of the, of the armor so that we can get a really nice view of the architecture and give us a peek into the cell surface dynamics, particularly as these cells are infecting people. So given the audience, I'll take a, a, a brief moment to explain the concept of, of bioorthogonal chemistry, which is what Carolyn is really, really, uh, really known for. So the idea of bioorthogonal chemistry is to use uh, chemistry you know, or chemical reaction uh, between two molecules, interaction between two molecules, and have that instead of happening in a glass tube on the bench, you have that reaction happen in a cell without actually disturbing anything else going on inside the cell. So here is sort of a, a schematic of that explain that idea. So you have um, a, a live bacterium, a cell that is happily growing in a culture, and then you have some molecule and here shown in red with some handle X, you know, you have some um, chemical uh, probe on the, on the exogenous uh, molecule here. And then you feed the cell this molecule and the cell happily accepts it because it recognizes it. And then it puts it where you want it to go. So in this case, we wanted the cell to, to put it on the, on, the, on the micromembrane that I talked about, the armor that I mentioned earlier. And then what happens is you bring some uh, secondary molecule or a second probe that has um, the paint that I mentioned or the fluorogenic molecule. Um, and this, these two molecules that have the handle Y and the handle X will selectively interact together in a bioorthogonal reaction. And that will put the paint onto the cell without actually either hurting the cell or, um, activating or, or ha having the cell recognize that something unusual is happening on the cell surface. And then once we have the, the fluorescent tag or the paint that, I, that I'm talking about uh, onto the cell, then what, it's then really easy to visualize the cell surface using a microscope in this case. So I'm just gonna show you an, uh, an example of this. Um, I, again, you don't need to get into the chemistry here, but we have shown that if you have this particular molecule, it's a sugar molecule that the cells really love and they use as part of their nutrition. Um, you can use this molecule and sort of modify it with this um, azi group that we know can be used as a, as a probe for bioorthogonal chemistry. And so we feed the cells with this uh, azido-modified sugar it, it gets into the cell, it goes through the metabolism and it gets inser um, inserted into the cell surface. And then you bring in your, your uh, brush with a, with, a cell, with a fluorescent marker. And then the brush will then undergo um, uh, biorthogonal reaction with the azi group. And then you have your fluorescein tag on, uh, onto the cells. And this is sort of what you see. So you see these like rod shaped bacteria here. When you look at the fluorescent channel, you see presence labeling of the cells. So this was really cool. This was already done when I joined the group. And my goal became, well, I want to use this technology or this like, concept of bioorthogonal chemistry to build a diagnostic technology for tuberculosis. 
and and so I in, in order thinking about that um, I we designed a probe that could you know be dark before it gets into the cell and then it only turns on once it's connected to the armor and it's like hey the bug is here and it's it's alive and so I'll just get dive a bit deeper onto the work that I've done here so we designed uh, a, a, a molecule that is, as I just said, is called sovatochromic. Sovatochromic meaning it changes its fluorescent state based on the environment it's in. And we knew that this particular molecule is non-fluorescent in aqueous solutions like water, and be, but becomes highly fluorescent in hydrophobic environments, like the very thick waxy cell surface membrane that I talked about um, that mycobacterium tuberculosis has. And so the idea is quite simple. You know, we make um, a sugar that is loaded with this dye called DMN. And the sugar, again, gets fed into the cells. The cells recognize the sugar, gets it in. Uh, but it, it's not fluorescent. It, and it only gets fluorescent once it's inside the cell surface and it's presented on the cell surface and where will turn green. And so, be, um, and so that means that this labeling step is actually specific to cells that are able to put the, the sugar onto the cell surface. So they have to be alive in order to do that. So then I went ahead and I, and I made the probe. Um, this is the actual chemical structure of diamantry halos. And, and then we wanted to test, okay, so this does this sugar that is carrying the, the dye actually behave the same way as just the dye. And we tested this by looking at um, the, the dye in water and or the dye in various mixture of water plus some um, hydrophobic solvents like oil, as you can see here. Um, and what we observed was that uh, surprisingly, um, the dye does not turn on even in um, solvents that have more than 1% water. So there has to be presence of less than 1% water in order for the probe to turn on, which is this line here. Um, so this is really encouraging. And at first we thought that if we put it in the cell, it might not even turn on at all because cells usually have proteins and other kinds of things that are going on that are actually quite polar. And so we wanted to put it on, on the culture and see what happens. So well, the, the protocol is quite simple. We have our reagents that we made um, that is just the sugar plus the dye. And then we have our culture of the bacteria. We, and then we just put them together uh, at 37 temperature, which is the body temperature for a few minutes and then see what happens. And so these are the first images that we saw. And I'm just gonna walk you through this. Here, there's a few cells, as you can see in the, the bright field. Um, the reagents that are reagents, the fluorescent reagents is swimming all over here and inside the cell. And what you can see is that within, it's when you're looking under the fluorescent microscope channel, you only see fluorescence from, from the reagents that have been incorporated into the cell. So none of the uh, reagents that are outside of the cell are actually visible. It was really cool because um, if you do the same experiment with some of the dyes that have been done before, this is what you would see. You would just get overwhelmed with background uh, fluorescence from um, dyes that are just sort of out in the environment that are not inside the cell. Whereas if we use our reagents, you actually see that it's very specific to the cells uh, and to inside of the cell. And because of that, we can actually do some real time monitoring of the insertion of these probes into the cells um, as uh, using a variety of, of bacteria here. And again, it's specific to bacteria that are able to put, um, that have the micromembrane, the armor that I talked about earlier. And we tested that by looking at a variety of bacteria, some that have the armor, the micromembrane, and others that don't. And what you notice and, and so these don'ts and the uh, coronabacterium glutamicum is a close cousin of mycobacterium tuberculosis and it actually has the mycomembrane. And what you will see is that 
a CG will actually label, but none of the other gram negatives and gram positives. So here we have E. coli, we have Staphorus and Listeria, none of them actually label. And we even went one step further and mixed them up together and saw if, uh, and tried to test if DM entry would actually pick out which ones have the micromembrane and which one doesn't. And so we mixed together these bacteria with um, Mycobacterium smegmatis, which also has the armor that I mentioned. And, and it's expressing red, uh, red fluorescent biomarker so that we know which one is Mycobacterium. And then we also added a, a DNA stain so that we can see all of the bugs that are part of the sample. And then we compare that with the DMN fluorescence channel and then try to see to superimpose where the green um, is compared to the blue and the reds. And so when you look here at the merged uh, image, what you will see is that the green actually merges quite nicely with the reds, which, but, not, but not the other blue bacteria. Suggesting that actually DMN is quite specific to mycobacteria, um, but not the other um, kinds of bacteria. So this is really good. Um, and so the next thing we wanted to test was because we knew that this labeling was required a cell that was alive, we thought, well, what if the cell is not alive? What would happen then? So we wanted to test that directly by um, incubating, by, by killing the cell somehow. Uh, and then seeing if we can expose them to the, the probes, if they will actually label. So again, so we incubate it, we do it uh, two different ways. We either heat kill the cells, so by exposing them to high heat, um, added DM entry, and then incubated and imaged. And so here um, on the top row are cells that were not uh, exposed to heat. On um, the bottom row are the cells that were exposed to heat. And what you can see is that the, the ones that are exposed to heat are not actually labeling with our probe, confirming that indeed they have to be alive and healthy in order for them to be able to digest the, the sugar that we're feeding them and actually put that on the cell surface. And this is just some quantification of that to show that there, it's, it's, um, there is not a significant um, fluorescence compared to the ones that are untreated. Um, and then we tried it in a different way. This time we try to kill the cells using drug treatment. And here we use, a, we put together a drug cocktail of, of uh, drugs that are actually used to treat tuberculosis in patients. Um, and we, we use that drug cocktail to uh, incubate the cells um, for three hours before adding our reagents and, and then labeling that for labeling the cell for 30 minutes. And same as before, what you can appreciate is that the ones that are not pre-killed by drug treatment are labeling just fine. Uh, but the ones that are pre-killed with the drug treatment um, are not actually able to incorporate the cells and present them on the cell surface. And so we actually don't see them um, by the microscopy. And we confirmed this by quantitation again. Um, so this was really, really exciting uh, experiment because it suggested that potentially this DM entry reagent that we have created um, could be used to tell uh, in patient samples which cells are actually alive and therefore um, transmitting and, and causing disease, active disease, and which cells are dead and are no longer a threat to uh, patients. And so we can actually monitor potentially, we could use this to monitor uh, treatment progression and hopefully um, a positive or, or negative outcome quite early on. But what if someone had a drug resistant strain uh, or, or a drug resistant case? Uh, would we be able to detect that with our probe? And so here, what we did, we set up a simple experiment. We had two types of mycobacterium, one that is the regular one that is drug susceptible. And then we made one that was um, resistant to this type of drug called isoniazid, which is also a tuberculosis drug. And 
what we did, we tested, well, we know wild type, um, when it's treated with SNI, that it dies. If we label with DM inhibitors, we can actually see it. We see the reduction of fluorescence intensity with increasing concentration of isoniazids. But for a bug that actually uh, is unaffected by isoniazid, it's resistant to isoniazid, what would happen with DM tre treatment? Would we see the same um, or would we see an increase or we see no change? Ideally, we want to see no change uh, as you increase the concentration of, of uh, acinizid because again, it's resistant. So we, that's exactly what we saw. We saw that when we label the acinizid resistance strain um, with the entry halos, it actually doesn't matter the concentration of acinizid in the, in the, in the solution. Um, it will all, always have the same level of um, fluorescence. Again, showing that we can potentially differentiate um, if patients are responding to treatment or if patients are not. So this was really exciting and it was as much as I could do uh, at Stanford and, uh, with, and with this particular pathogen that I was working with, MS Megmatis, I actually needed to don the outfits that I showed you before, go in the biosafety level three facility and, and work directly with mycobacterial tuberculosis. Um, and so this is the first experiment that I did where I essentially replicated the experiment I just talked about using, you know, how you grow mycobacterium tuberculosis. Um, you can have just regular labeling of the normal healthy cells, or you can expose them to drugs, kill them therefore, and then expose them to our reagent and see what happens. And just as before, um, what you notice is that the ones that are, are drug killed are actually not labeling with DM entry halos, confirming what we've um, what we've done before. And just to give you a comparison, um, this is the currently used stain to diagnose tuberculosis uh, at the point of care right now today. It's called, it's an oramine stain that has been, um, that, that was developed in the early 1900s and has been used around the world ever since then. And, and using the same procedure that I, uh, I mentioned before, where we have two types of treatment, one without drugs and one with drugs, what you can see is that the oramine labels both of them um, similarly. And it actually is not able to distinguish between the bugs that are alive and the bugs that are dead. And it, it's not useful at all to monitor drug treatment at the point of care. So, do, this experiment showed us that actually our reagents had a superior and potentially uh, um, groundbreaking um, uh, bonus, and that could be useful for point of care detection and treatment monitoring at the uh, the point of care. So. Uh, at this point, uh, I was wrapping up my PhD and, and we had found this reagents that could leverage uh, use uh, existing equipment to do tuberculosis diagnosis, could label within minutes, it could be uh, automated and could potentially monitor treatment efficacy at the point of care, which uh, is still not uh, currently available. So then I flew to South Africa and I set up multiple projects to actually confirm all of these um, using clinical samples from patients, uh, donated from patients. So the first collaboration we set up was with Professor Bavesh Khanna at Vitz University and his trainee and postdoc, uh, uh, Christopher Eland, who him and I were connected and we set up these experiments together. And the goal here was one, can we actually confirm the, what I've done at Stanford um, in South Africa. We collected sputum samples in Johannesburg from patients that had been diagnosed with tuberculosis. We followed the same clinical procedure that they use um, in South Africa. And then right at the, at the step where they use oramine smear, um, we split the samples into two and one was followed through with the oramine smear and the other was followed through with our reagents, DM and tree labeling. And then we essentially tested if we can actually see MTB cells in sputum samples. And so these are the first images from um, our collaboration. 
And what you can tell is that we can readily see cells that are labeled with um, DM entry halos. And this is really exciting. And we have, and this was right before the pandemic. And we, we are hoping to resume this work and actually do the clinical studies that we want, which is to look at whether we can monitor um, treatment uh, uh, efficacy uh, using our reagents in this um, format. The next uh, collaboration we set up was with um, a couple of really smart doctors in Durban who had been noticing that their patients that have both HIV and tuberculosis often come to the hospital when they're really, really sick and they give them treatment, but they don't respond um, to treatment uh, often. And they can't tell whether a patient will actually uh, get better or get worse. And so what they're really interested in is being able to use our probe to figure out quite quickly if someone is actually responding to treatment, i.e. if the cells are actually dying within a matter of days instead of a matter of weeks. And so we set up a collaboration um, to look at the, the, the mycobacterium tuberculosis that is disseminated in bloodstream um, and see if cells are uh, from baseline and throughout treatment, if cells are changing, either dying or not dying in response to treatment. So again, same as before, we followed similar clinical procedure that they standard clinical procedure that they usually follow in the hospital. Retrieve the plasma from patients that are both are, um, co-infected with HIV and, and tuberculosis. We do some minimal processing of the blood samples, and then we incubate with our reagents um, overnight and image right away. And these are the first um, images that we collected in, in spring of 2020, um, where we could readily see that um, we, we observe uh, MTB cells um, in the blood samples in a variety of shapes, actually. Um, and we are, this was really exciting to us because at first we didn't know if it was gonna work because uh, it had never been done before. It's smear, state, smear staining of mycobacterium tuberculosis in blood samples. And the fact that we're actually able to see them is uh, sort of the first time that we are able to look at the morphology of MTB cells and blood samples. And, and so it's exciting even from the, the perspective of research possibility. And in addition, we're quite excited to then now do the clinical study that we, are, are we envisioned of looking at whether we can now use this system, that, this pipeline that we've built with DM entry halos and see if we can monitor treatment efficacy in patients that are really, really sick with tuberculosis. So, um, and then I only have a couple more projects to mention and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, here, I, I came back to Stanford and I, 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 made, I built a whole new class of other types of trihalos derivatives using chemistry. And in particular, this uh, hydroxychromone dye yeah, is much brighter than any of the other ones that I had built before. In fact, it's about 10 times brighter than DM entry halos. And that could potentially, that was, you really use for in terms of applications on the field. Turns out that DMN was actually a, a dimmer uh, dye than we, that we wanted it to be, and using a brighter dye could actually be really helpful. And we actually confirmed this um, once we went back to South Africa with the new dye, 3HC3-Chahelos, where we noticed that even at small concentrations of um, this dye, we actually can detect mycobacterium tuberculosis in sputum samples even at concentrations where you wouldn't be able to detect anything with DM entry halos, the original dye. And this is significant because when we use this new dye, we can actually begin to detect the labeling within 10 minutes of uh, incubation with a probe, as opposed to waiting for an hour um, with DM entry halos. In the context of point of care detection, this 10 minute labeling reagents is, is really exciting. And, and we've since gotten a lot of interest from clinicians and doctors all over the world who are really interested in getting their hands on this, on this new probe. The last collaboration I have is, is sort of putting together this vision of a point of care detection kit. Um, we now have designed these probes that could be used in a simpler way, in a cheap way, um, at the point of care. 
what we were missing is a detector that can come with that. Um, clinics nowadays have to buy this $2,000 fluorescent microscope in order to do the smear testing that I've shown you um, so far. And so we collaborated with the, the lab, uh, Manu Prakash at Stanford uh, Bioengineering, to try to design a low cost, battery powered, portable mini microscope uh, that could be worked in conjunction with our dyes for decentralized tuberculosis detection and treatment monitoring. So the idea was simple. We designed, this is our uh, image of our first protocol, uh, first prototype. We designed a small um, sort of backbone basic uh, mini microscope that has the, all the things you imagine a microscope has, a camera, a lens, an objective, a stage, and importantly, a laser. And all of this um, is battery powered. So you don't actually need to plug it in anywhere. And the goal is that it will be connected to Wi-Fi where the data is, is collected on, with the microscope and then is sent directly through the crowd, through the internet to the cloud and someone somewhere else, either a patient or a provider could actually have access to the results without being on site. Our, prototype, our, our, our prototypes are small. They're the size of a, 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 a tissue box. And I, the goal here is that they will be able to fit in a backpack and could be um, mobile enough that community health workers could, could take them with them um, into the community. And again, by design, we wanted an automated image collection, as I mentioned, battery powered, and it could be it could last about a day of active use without needing to recharge. Um, and, and there's no special training required. And, and here, as you can see, it's very sort of low tech, simple um, processing. And so all you really need to do is take the sample, put it onto the stage and turn on the laser and image. And we've gone pretty successful with this project, um, uh, uh, not just optimizing the prototype, but also optimizing the image acquisition and the software to do the quantitation of the fluorescence. So here are just some example images from um, our, as we're calling it, ITB scope uh, device, where you can see that, the, again, the brightness of the hydroxychrome on Trujillos, the, the, our latest dye, um, is vastly superior compared to our original dye, which is not as bright as the hydroxychromone. And because it's so much brighter, we can actually do some really cool stuff. We can do some um, fluorescence intensity. We can count how many cells have what kind of intensity. We can um, uh, do cell size, cell shape uh, analyses where we can figure out what kind of cell we're looking at. And all of that could be done within a, a, a software program that we have written. And, 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 and at the point of care, no one needs to sort of know the back end that is going on. All they get is this sort of a result that tells them what the fluorescence intensity is um, and the count of the bacteria that are labeling. And so with that, I'll just sort of quickly wrap up my, uh, my research project. So I hope that I showed you that this new dye um, could be really uh, wonderful and, and, and revolutionary in the context of tuberculosis diagnosis at the point of care. And it can detect MTB in sputums and blood samples, and it could potentially uh, report on cell viability and, and clinical samples, and therefore uh, uh, could be used to monitor treatment outcome in patients. And we're now working with engineers and clinicians to build a portable mini microscope that could be used um, in, in, uh, in, at the point of care uh, in rural settings uh, and could be uh, mobile enough that community health, community health workers could be, used, could be using them outside of clinics and outside of hospitals um, to screen TB patients. At the end of this work, it, you know, I, I had probably about 30 ongoing collaborations all over the world. And we decided to build, to, to put together a mission-driven enterprise to actually deliver these probes at the point of care for a couple of reasons. One, it was the end of my PhD. I actually needed to graduate and, and, and needed to put this, uh, all these work and these collaborations in a system that could sustain longer than my, my education. Um, and two, we, by that point, we had... Uh, 
multiple partners and funding sources that actually needed to take it over and do the clinical trial to validate these probes as potential uh, diagnostic biomarkers. And along the way, you know, I, I, I built a vast network of mentors and mentees. I, what you can appreciate from this project is it was a multiple discipline. It was a multidisciplinary project. So I, I learned a lot of chemistry. I did a lot of microbiology and molecular biology. I even got into public health and, and clinical trialing, uh, which is uh, way beyond anything that I had ever expected to do for my PhD. I mentored talented students at, at Berkeley and at Stanford. Um, the, these are my two high school mentees that worked with me on some of the clinical work that I was doing towards the later time, uh, my later years of my PhD. And this is my wonderful undergrad, Brian, who's now in med at medical school at UPenn. And I've also gotten a lot of traveling. I went to Sub-Saharan Africa. I went to Asia to do some of the clinical work. And I also went to conferences. And this is the Bertozzi group. We were all in Hawaii, uh, where I gave a talk on my work at that time. And this is me and a few of the Bertozzi uh, groups uh, in, at a conference in Paris, um, again, where I was presenting my work. So just to sort of close the loop on my goals, I, I ended up not just accomplishing my goals, but actually adding, accomplishing even goals that I didn't even think that I could accomplish. I have found a project that I really liked and I am still do even today. I worked with an advisor who I admired, but who actually ended up being uh, a great supporter all throughout and, and, a, and a great sponsor throughout the many uh, grant writing that I did and, and the many presentation and conference invitations that I ended up receiving. Um, I, this is actually no longer accurate. I have about four papers now and, and a couple more on the way. And unfortunately, it didn't take five years. Turns out PhDs often times take longer than I imagined they will. And uh, it took about seven years for me to accomplish it. Um, and then I, I did find quote unquote a job, uh, but it's, it's a post independent postdoctoral position that I'll talk about in a minute. Um, I went to several international uh, trips to collaborators, to conferences, um, and I have since gotten a lot of press coverage about my work and I have started a company, which to this day, I'm still surprised by. Um, and now once all of that wrapped up, I am now at Harvard University um, as a junior fellow. And what that really means is I'm an independent researcher who gets to design uh, a project uh, and gets to continue doing the work that I was doing before and also bring in new, new partners and new collaborators um, to continue building these diagnostic devices. And uh, stay tuned for more papers, um, but I'm really excited to be here because I've built a network of peers at Harvard University who are doing um, fantastic work both in my field and outside of my field. And I, I've been able to continue uh, using the lessons learned that I, uh, uh, throughout, that I've learned throughout my PhD, even during my time here, despite a pandemic. So I thought I would share some of those with you uh, in the last minute that I have. Um, and, 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 and hopefully that will be helpful to you as well as you think about your own career, whether in science or outside of science. And the first thing that I learned is that it's helpful to identify what you're really passionate about. Uh, I've always been passionate about the world that surrounds us and how it works. And that has helped me um, per be persistent um, throughout undergraduate research programs and throughout graduate school. Uh, it's it, it's a lot of fun. It also has a lot of challenges and identifying what your passion is and doing something that you really love helps you keep at it and get through the many challenges that you will face. The second thing I learned is it's helpful to work with people you like, that you'd like to learn from, that you, that you feel supported by, and that are really uh, there to, to work together to partner with you um, and build something that uh, you also believe in. 
and I'm really lucky that I was I managed to to find a, an incredibly supportive network, um, both in undergrad, in graduate school, and now. Um, that being said, don't limit yourself to just the, the your peers, your classmates. B uh, build your network broadly. Go outside of your field. The people in this pictures, they're all outside of my field. They're all professors now. Um, and, and you know, on this picture we have right next to me is Pedro, who's a historian, and he's now a professor at Stanford. Sarah, who's a classicist, uh, and also a professor at Stanford. Rediet is a computer scientist uh, at Berkeley. And Chris is a professor of law. And all of them are my really close friends. And they have actually contributed to, significantly to uh, the design of my current work here at Harvard. Even though they themselves are not biochemists, the types of questions and the ideas that they bring up are just increase a, a richness to the work that I'm, that I'm doing. Stay connected with your mentors. Um, you will never know when you're going to need them again, even after you finish your uh, graduate work. Um, and you, uh, they, they will always have words of wisdom that will almost always be helpful at any stage of your career. It continues to be helpful to me to be connected with Carolyn today. Um, and she continues to give me advice on what, how to move forward uh, and who to connect with next for the next steps of this project. And lastly, keep an open mind. Um, I was doing a PhD in biology. I started my PhD in molecular and cellular biology and I finished my PhD in biology while being in a chemistry lab. But as you notice in my, in my, my presentation, I, I did a lot of microbiology. I even ended up going outside of all of those um, fields and, and, and designed clinical trials thought about epidemiology and diagnostics um, and therapies. And so I would, I would uh, the last, the parting gift to you would be to keep an open mind about what else could be done with a particular project. And, and again, seeking conversation with people who are outside of your field is tremendously helpful for that. So I think I'm a little over time, so I'll just end here. Um, thank everybody that has um, supported me throughout this project, all the funders that have supported us both here in the US and in South Africa. Um, and of course, we thank the patients that have kindly donated their samples. And I thank you for listening and I'll take any questions now. All right, I just wanted to... Um... You, know, you have this thank you slide, but we wanted to thank you. Um, that was a, a fantastic talk, uh, really interesting about your, your personal story as well as your research. Um, some of it personally brought me back, like poster presentations and stuff like that, although I never got to go anywhere as, as cool as you did. <laughs> but, um, that being said, and also really, I know we're going to do questions, but really quick, uh, science is such a small world. So Peyton, I know him. He was a he was a friend of mine's roommate in undergrad and I met him when I was, so it's, so science is a very small world. But um, anyway, um, yeah. I just wanted to let everybody, I guess if everybody could just maybe you unmute yourself or use your um, emojis just to thank Dr. Camariza. And then we are gonna open up the floor to questions. Um, we have opened up the chat to everybody. So please um, let your, you know, um, please, uh, fire away your questions and Sophia and I will be uh, facilitating that. Thank you. Can I cut in front of the line, Christina? Um, I mean, you're the boss, so go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say how much uh, I appreciate uh, hearing your presentation and your talk and this amazing work and you, you make it sound so you know, approachable and relatable. So thank you very much uh, uh, for that. So I have like two sort of strands of questions, one sort of directly related to your research and a couple not. So I'll start with the one about the research work. So you talked about your uh, chemically modified exogenous substrate that is entering into the cell. So how does it enter into the cell? Is it going in through a transporter or something like that? Or uh, how, do, how does it cross over the membrane and go into the cell? 
That's a very good question. Um, and, and depending on the application that you're looking at, it, it, there could be a variety of ways. For my actual application, I leveraged the biosynthetic pathway of trehalose, the sugar that I loaded my dye onto. The sugar itself actually is often recognized by the cell and is used as a, as a building block to build a micromembrane where I wanted to deliver my probe to. And so by tagging, I essentially made, you know, I did some chemistry and I, I attached the dye to the sugar and the, both of them get into the cell membrane and that's how you get fluorescence. Great, thank you. Uh, the the non-research uh, related questions are really of, on behalf of our students uh, who are here in this room and for their benefit. So there's uh, sort of three things that you mentioned, I think are worth a little bit more exploration. One, you talked about being an HHMI scholar and I'm not entirely sure many of our students know what that is. So if you could elaborate a little bit more on that. And you also talked about having an advisor as an undergraduate. And that is not a concept we have here at the community colleges where our students go to a counselor. So if you could talk a little bit more about the role of an advisor versus uh, uh, what, what, you could, what a student can expect when they transfer to an undergraduate university and uh, work, start working with an advisor. And lastly, I'm a big fan of SACNIS and you mentioned you went to a SACNIS conference and if you could also make a plug about and tell our students about what SACNIS is, that would be fantastic. Yes, these are all great questions. By the way, when I was in community college, I also had no clue what an advisor was and how, what the system was um, in graduate school or an undergrad. So the first question was HHMI, what is the summer program for HHMI? I don't know if it's, I think it still does. It still does exist. HHMI has an undergraduate summer research program called the Hughes Scholarship. Um, and it's essentially two to three months over the summer. Um, you apply for it the year before, I think. Um, and you, you, uh, you know, the application process is similar to other summer programs. You get, if you get accepted, you get matched to a faculty member at a local four-year university. I was, I was a community college student at San Diego Mesa College. So I was in San Diego and I was matched with a professor at UC San Diego. There are others that were matched, I think, at San Diego State. And through that, what you do during the summer, essentially you do research. There is a um, outline of the type of mentorship that you should have from your faculty member. And what I really liked about that summer program, at least back in my day, which is now more than 10 years ago, uh, we actually were getting paid because I was a community college student and I needed, I needed to live, I needed money to live. And that, that program actually compensated us for doing the summer research program at school so we could, I could actually leave my job for two months. Um, so that's what HMI, the Hughes Scholars Program, that I participated in was. The second question was um, advisorship. I mentioned an advisor at UC San Diego. So again, this was leveraging my network from the Hughes scholarship that I spent that summer. We learned that if you transfer, there are actually year round um, summer or year round research programs that undergraduate could take advantage of, particularly minority undergraduates that would essentially, again, pay you to do research instead of working. And most, a lot of transfer students at UC San Diego struggled with a livelihood. And I was certainly part of them. And, and I was really lucky that at the end of the huge um, summer program that I did, they told us about all the available research programs at UC San Diego. And I just applied to them as I was applying to transfer to UCSD. And I was very lucky that I got the, the Mark Scholarship, which covers you for two years. And so essentially the entirety of my time at UC San Diego was covered in terms of tuition and in terms of uh, stipends um, to do, essentially take classes and do research. And as part of that program, you select an advisor who helps you devise a research project um, and, and accomplish that research project so that by the time you're a senior undergraduate student, the, the, your thesis is part of your uh, graduation coursework that goes towards your degree. 
So that actually being part of the research community helped me tremendously even to achieve my, my degree much faster than others. And I believe the last question uh, was conferences, uh, SACNAS. Um, and again, this was the summer research program. I didn't know about conferences. I didn't know about SACNAS or Abercams. Um, I, I, I didn't know scientists aggregated in conference communities and talked to each other about science. And I think one of the great things about the Hughes Scholar Program was that people who had gone through that summer program where had the ability to submit a, a request for funding um, and to go to conferences. And so we're all encouraged to do that. And I, I was one of the lucky ones that got the funding and I went to SACNAS that year. And then I met so many other undergraduate researchers that we all communicated. And then we ended up going to Abrakims soon after that. And you know, once you start, again, network is everything. Once you start talking to people and learning what's out there, it just, it becomes such an enriching environment to grow as a scientist. Thank you so much. All right, awesome, thank you. There are um, many, many questions in the chat and I am roughly trying to kind of uh, divide them into to sort of science and business and life. Um, but I guess as far as, um, um, one question that I think would be good to have answered is a student asked about, you know, you've had many different positions and roles and throughout your, your uh, educational career and sort of right now, what is your day to day life kind of look like? So what is what is going to work look like for you? Wow, during a pandemic, that's an interesting, that's an easy question. Yeah, stay at home. <laughs> yeah, I um, I'm now. I'm an independent postdoctoral researcher. Um, so what that means is I, I design my own research and I do research on my own. And I'm I'm quite uh, lucky and privileged that the work that I, I'm currently doing was interesting enough that I actually connected with scientists at the Broad Institute. And the Broad Institute is, is this really amazing um, uh, place where researchers that think about public health um just global medicine um and with a focus on on genetics and, and and genomic sequences so when you think of the omicron variant or the delta variant here in massachusetts the broad institute is the one that sort of monitor these variants in massachusetts and and, and really is driving force for covid 19 diagnostic and so I connected, this is before the pandemic in 2019, I connected with the director of the Broad Institute and I sort of pitched them my idea as an independent researcher and, and they invited me to be part of the Broad Institute and that's where I work now um, as, a, as a researcher. So my day-to-day -day varies um, depending on whether I need to be at the bench on the actual lab. Um, if I need to be in the lab, I would get up and go to work. I would actually go to the Broad, um, do my, research experiments, so to speak, right? Like put together, design the protocol of the day, do the research, um, and then and then come home. If I don't do, if I'm not in the lab, I am usually at home doing computational work. So I do have some computational projects where I do a lot of coding um, um, or I'm doing this type of stuff. I'm, I'm either giving presentations uh, or teaching a course uh, or meeting with students that I'm working with in the lab. I don't know if that's helpful. I, I think it most definitely is. Um, yeah, so yeah, thank you. Um, there's some other questions Just looking through the chat here. Um, one question is about how did you go about, um, there are two separate questions, but one is sort of how did you go about maybe supplementing your education so are there topics outside of what you were immediately studying that you had to research and how did you go about doing that um and another one was how did you sort of know that you were on the right path throughout i guess your work it wasn't necessarily um implied but maybe how did you kind of uh navigate that part of i guess i guess the phd process so for the that's the first question both questions are really really good the for the first question I was get my getting myself involved in many areas of research that are not that were not part of my particular training uh, as a young PhD student, and 
it, it depending on what it is. So for instance, when we started the company, um, I didn't and I didn't have a strong background in business or finance or or even leadership. Um, and I ended up taking a summer course uh, at, at the Stanford Business School. And it actually had this like crash course uh, starting your own company as a researcher type class. It was 10 weeks long and it was tailored to people like me and it was great. Outside of that, um, I didn't really take courses, but rather I uh, um, shadowed people. You know, you can, I can, or I, I hung out with people uh, long enough that I could actually absorb the information. So for instance, in South Africa, I flew there and I spent a month in Professor Bavesh Khanna's lab. And, and there I, we, I would connect it to the nurses and the doctors who were collecting the samples. I went, in, I went in there and I looked at the setup. I understood how it worked. And, and just by virtue of being exposed to their lives um, and, and their own uh, professional processes, I was able to take that information and bring it back to me with Stan at Stanford and, and rethink the whole pipeline that we had built given the new information that I had gotten from there. And that's true for uh, everything else that I'm doing in life. Like with the pandemic, we had to redesign how we do tuberculosis work given that uh, the, there was uh, um, limited resources that were now available for doing tuberculosis since all of it was now focused on COVID-19. So I think parts, I, I want at some point in your career, you know, taking classes doesn't cover all of the information that you need to acquire. And I think uh, connecting with people who are experts in their field and learning from them directly is, it has been what's been the most successful for me. Um, the second question was, how did I know if I'm on the right path? I don't know if I'm on the right path today um i i don't know does anyone ever know that they're on the right path i i will say that <laughs> I, I will say that for me i i just like doing the things that i am passionate about i'm passionate about equity so i'm involved heavily in that i am passionate about infectious disease so i'm heavily involved in that i'm passionate about the intersection of chemistry and biology that's what i'm really good at and, and, and so that's what I do. I just, I, I, I continue doing the things that bring me joy, so to speak. And then I've, I've been really fortunate that the things that I really like doing ha have also been impactful in the world. Very awesome, thanks. So um, I hope we're not giving you too much whiplash here, but I think it'd be good to switch to a couple science-based questions now. So how to keep a little okay. variety going. So um, one of the questions in the chat was actually a question I had as well is, um, you mentioned how the, the waxy coating of the mycobacterium is, is rare, right? So are there any other like um, organisms that have that? And are, is there a problem with maybe false positive tests due to that? That's a very good question. And short answer is yes. Um, there is some, there is a wide variety of bugs that actually have the waxy cell surface and that are able to in, um, get labeled with our probes. And the, the short answer to what well, the following question was going to be, so how do we ensure specificity to tuberculosis? And the, and, and the shortest answer is the application that we're actually using it for is as a screening test, not a confirmation diagnosis tool. But the goal really is here at the point of care, um, can we screen who is who needs to go to the hospital and who doesn't? And our probe is more specific than the currently used oramine because the oramine just stains basically almost everything, um, and ours doesn't. And the the second layer to that is um, at the point of care again, can we screen if someone has a drug resistance case or not? But in all cases, it's just a screening tool. There has to be, it has to be followed up with more um, involved testing measures like a uh, antigen test or a PCR test um, or even culture test to really validate the, the results. Right, yeah, that makes sense. 
Um, I had a quick question. Well, there's one question. Let's do actually another science question first. Um, there's one question about does the um, bug ever go dormant? I'm not entirely sure what that's referring, what that exactly means, but is there a way to detect it if it's not, if I guess maybe if there's not, not an active infection, that's my interpretation of the, of the question, I think. Really good question. And it's actually very specific to TV. So we have a TV connoisseur in the, in the room. Um, so tuberculosis has two, two main um, types of disease. So there's the active type where someone is actively presenting symptoms and, um, and, and really sick. And then there is sort of a, a dormant type called uh, latent TB, where the, somebody has been able to contain the, the uh, infection in the lung. Um, they're not presenting symptoms, but that infection is there and it could be reactivated at any point in their lives. And so I believe the question is asking whether we can detect latent TB. And the short answer is, um, as long as patients are, are able to produce sputum with pathogens in them, then yes, we can detect. The, the issue oftentimes with latent TB cases is that in their sputum production or even cough uh, drops, they're not actually coughing out any of these bugs because it's, it's well contained in, in the lungs. Um, but we are interested in this question and, and several of our partners are as well. So we're really working together to devise a different way of um, labeling uh, or at least detecting these bugs in latent TB cases. Great, cool. Um, I'm gonna jump the line a little bit myself now, just cause um, I'd, I'd be remiss to not ask at least a couple questions about the molecules. And I also wanna highlight for our students how uh, multidisciplinary this work is and how that's uh, definitely an increasing trend, I think, in STEM in general. Um, so those, you showed us a couple different dyes. On one side, there was, I believe there were three. And I'm just wondering, generally speaking, how many synthetic steps are we talking to make those? And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the, you mentioned how it's, um, you know, the, the dyes turn on in a hydrophobic environment. Typically, it's the opposite. And it's because it re relies on some sort of protonation step. So I was wondering if you could explain a little bit about that as well. I'm, I've been very curious. Yeah, wow. What a very chemistry focused question. Um, you know, what can I say? Yeah. <laughs> um, first question was how many steps? It depends on the probe. Sure. So for DMN, given that it was sort of our, our it was my bread and butter for such a long time, I was I managed to reduce the the, the, the synthetic steps to about five steps. And here I was leveraging click chemistry, honestly. So it would load an amine and then put a, a azide group on it. And then you would bring in the dye using um, sort of click chemistry. Right. And then at the, the second, so for the hydroxychromones, actually, those were really difficult to synthesize because the, first of all, they're not soluble in water. They're really difficult to work with and, and they're pretty bulky. And so there are many right, yeah. thoughts that you can, that reactions can occur. And so it, we have to use a blocking steps to make sure that the trailers loads onto the right place. So anyways, I don't remember. I think it's not like down to eight or nine steps with the reasonable yield. Um, anyways, we got into very chemistry answer there. So I don't know if that was helpful for the rest of the audience. Um, the second question was, remind me again, the second question, I'm just curious about um, the dyes turning on in a hydrophobic versus uh, hydrophilic environment, and because it's usually the opposite is what most of the commercial dyes do. So, yeah, that's a very good question. Turns out that there is a wide variety of sulfatochromic dyes. These are dyes that change their color based on the micro uh, environment. So there are dyes that, like DMN, turn on. Um, you know, remain dark in aqueous solutions and, and turn on in hydrophobic solutions. There are dyes that do the opposite. Right. That, you know, are like you just said. But then there are other dyes that are always on, but are detectable in different channels depending on their solution. So one of the dyes that I didn't talk about today that, but that we've worked on is a dye that is fluorescent in the green channel in water. And then it becomes fluorescent in the red channel in, in, in oil, in hydrophobic environments. So it's actually really quite interesting once you get into the, you dive a bit deeper into the world of 
fluorogenic probes and, and what you know and what parameters are, are influencing their behavior. Right. Yeah, no, it's a huge, huge thing. Yeah. And it's pH yeah. dependency and all that. So yeah, so I think it's really interesting. Um, I just want to be mindful of time here. So we've got a few more minutes. Let's ask, uh, let's switch to a little bit more um, you know, life and career based questions, if that's okay. Um, one question that I, I thought was a good one was, um, do you have any advice on how to actually go about this networking with other researchers? Like you, you spoke about that for, um, for a while. So how, do you, how does one start networking? Yeah, that's a very good question. I guess it depends on your uh, career stage. I'm assuming this is a student who asked me this question. Um, I, again, I absolutely leveraged the, the research groups I was in, the research programs primarily that I was in uh, right at the very beginning. I, you know, I had just moved to the US. I didn't really know anyone um, outside of my family and, and I even really didn't know this world of research. And so I didn't have a network, so to speak, and, and I needed to start essentially from the ground up. And the way I did it, and I don't know if this is the right way, at least it was the more organic way that I went about it was to leverage these research programs. So when I was in community college, I was, shout out to our community college professors. Um, I was really, really lucky that my, the, my introduction to, introductory to chemistry course um, professor spoke French. And at the time I was still learning English. So it was really, really helpful that this is somebody that I could, I felt like I could communicate with somewhat easily. Um, and, 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 and through her connecting with me and us getting to work together and getting to know each other, she actually is the one who told me about the, the Hughes program, scholars program in the first place. And so through her, I learned about the Hughes program and I was then part of the, the, that summer program and through that, I met uh, other peers like me who are in community colleges, but also met faculty members at UC San Diego, which helped me tremendously when I, that fall, I was on the, um, uh, on the application um, circuit trying to transfer to a four-year university. And so, you know, actually, once you start getting into that network, it just, it's one step, you know, one, one person connects it to the other and then connects it to the other. So when I was part of the, the Hughes Scholars Program, I learned about the Mark Program and I was part of that. And I got connected to Dr. Tracy Johnson. Uh, and then Tracy herself had, had gone to UC Berkeley for her PhD. So she told me, she connected me to professors at Berkeley who then connected me to Professor Rettorzi at Berkeley. So, you know, it, it really goes from one person to the other. And I think um, it's just forging those initial relationships that is incredibly helpful. All right, thank you. And now I think Sophia, if you wanna come on, I think we're gonna ask our last uh, question and then I will make an announcement about our next seminar and then we will, we will wrap things up. We wanna be respectful of your time. So we're approaching 1230. So we're asking Elias, uh, Elias' question, right? Yeah. Um, so, Dr. Kemery, is a, you know, you've you've mentioned a lot about your experience being in community college and our students here are in community college. So, if you could just share, um, this the student had the question: Is it rare for you to encounter others in the field in academia who've gone through that journey, and what has that been like, just having that background in community college? That's a really good question. Um, I have to say. I don't go asking people if they went to a community college. <laughs> so it's it's challenging to know who in my environment has gone to a community college. But I will say that at conferences, it's quite common for folks to talk about their community college experience because that's usually where sort of the first exposure to conferences comes from. And, and when we find each other, man, let me tell you, it's, you know, it, it's just, it's, we reminisce and, and we, we, we sort of see each other about our, the challenges that we had to overcome to make it where we are. Uh, particularly for me here at Harvard, I, you know, I, I can't think of anyone right now who's in my lab or in, in, in my network that has gone to a community college similar to me. So it, it's, it's, yeah, when we find each other, it's just an amazing experience.
All right. Yeah, no, thank you for sharing that. But um, yeah, you're right, right? You're not going to necessarily be like, oh, can I see your CV before I, I talk to you? But um, yeah, I think there's definitely something to say about the experience that sort of experiences that sort of bond people together. So that, that's awesome to hear. Um, so once again, um, we just wanted to thank you very, very much for taking the time out of your very busy schedule to speak with us. Um, your talk was really, really interesting from your personal story to the science. And I, I, I personally thoroughly enjoyed it. And I, I do not think I am in a minority here. So, um, so thank you very much for that um, and for fielding all of our questions. Um, to those of you who maybe we did not get to your questions, I'm sorry about that. We had a lot of interest in the talk today and a lot to, co to cover, but um, thank you very much. And um, to our Foothill people, we just wanted to remind you that you can always join the SLL newsletter to be kept up to date about what events are coming up. Sophia has posted that in the chat. And we do have another CESO seminar on uh, Friday, March 7th. Uh, Dr. Wendy Smith is going to talk to us about her experiences and you'll be getting that information shortly, but in the meantime, you might wanna mark your calendars. So thank you all for attending. Thank you once again to our speaker, Dr. Camariza, and everybody have a lovely weekend. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much, Dr. Camariza.